When exploring abandoned places, a grail is a spot that hasn't been touched by vandals, hasn't been redeveloped, and still houses historic artifacts in their original places. Grails are extremely rare, especially now with social media being able to spread info and locations immediately. Fortunately, we found one of those grails, a historic mill collapsing on a secluded river. It was abandoned in 1958 with nearly everything left inside. Part of what makes it a grail is the location, surrounded on three sides by a river and accessible only by, ah, you didn't think I'd actually tell you that part, did you? All you need to know is that this place is special. Welcome to the abandoned Potter Hill Mill. We made it here on a chilly day in April. The mill had been on my radar for years, but I had never seen it up close. Getting close is its own challenge though. The entire main structure collapsed in on itself a few years ago. Some explorers made it here right before that happened, but we'll get to that a little later. In order to understand why this mill is so special, we have to go back to the past. So let's hop in my time machine here, which yes, is a Dell's Lemonade cup because yeah, time travel makes me thirsty. And yeah, maybe I want Dell's to send me some free lemonade. Welcome to the 1700s, which, for context, is after the 1600s, but before the 1800s. Back then, people in England had their entire society built up around mills. It was their way of life, and they brought it on the ships to New England. Which, I like to imagine they did, literally, so forgive me while I ignore historical accuracy. What were these mills used for? That's a good question. The most well-known were grist mills, which ground corn and wheat into flour and sawmills, which cut up wood for construction. Then, during the Industrial Revolution, you had the textile industry exploding. There were fulling mills, which made cloth, carding mills, which untangled and cleaned wool fibers, dyeing mills, and coffee milk mills, where early Rhode Islanders would get their favorite beverage. So, through the 1800s, businessmen and manufacturers built, and they built, and oh boy, did they build those mills. They brought jobs to the areas where they were built, and with jobs came economic and societal growth, which on one hand was a good thing, but on the other hand, they generally valued profits over everything. Workers were kept in perpetual poverty, and owners employed children to work in some of the most dangerous conditions in America. I know, it's pretty terrible, but don't worry. I wrote them a negative Yelp review, so I think we're good. Mill buildings were simple and sturdy, built to withstand the strong vibrations generated by the water wheels. This mill followed the same trend, but has one awesome design feature. This beauty was constructed with pink granite, which makes for quite the striking view at sunset. We made it to the mill close to golden hour, picking our way through the woods, passing discarded farm and manufacturing equipment. We're coming up to Potter Hill Mill now close to sunset, so the lighting is really beautiful. You can already see pieces of machinery out here in the woods. All right, there's a lot to see here. So before we get into the full exploration, I think it makes sense to show you what used to be here and what's still here today. The history of this spot dates back to the 1700s, but production really didn't pick up here until 1835 when a two-story wood frame mill was constructed on the river for cotton spinning and dressing. You can see it in the foreground of this photo. This is the only building that isn't on the property today because in 1977, a fire of unknown origin ripped through the structure, taking it right down to the foundation. So what's left of the property today? Well, thanks to an inventory of historic engineering and industrial sites published in 1978, I can tell you exactly what you're looking at. Let's get into it. First is the foundation for the original mill with water still flowing underneath. The charred remains were removed shortly after the fire. Here is a weave shed still containing dozens of wool looms. 
And you can't miss the main granite building constructed in 1843. Right next to it is a wooden building that housed wool spinning frames. Behind these is the two-story brick boiler house and chimney. Past that, on the northern side, is the machine shop where we started our exploration. We didn't have a whole lot of time to explore, but what we did see was amazing. Equipment just left out to rust. The machine you're looking at is likely a picker, one of the first steps in processing wool. This machine would pick out stones, sticks, seeds, and other foreign objects. The wool came out of the picker in flat sheets known as lap. Workers rolled the lap and carried it to the carting rooms in the main structure where we were heading next, the giant pink granite building. There were other pieces of gear in here, valves, piping, and ducts just quietly resting. A strange contrast to how loud it used to be here back in the day. The building we were in is on the left, and the remains of the boiler house to the right was super haggard. The floor doesn't exist in some places, and the ceiling collapsed, which, as you'll see, will become a theme here. But we were still able to squeeze in through an opening to see one of the massive boilers still intact. We came upon one more piece of mystery machinery before heading into the main building. Well, we found what's left of a car here. Look at that, you can see the transmissions right there. Yeah. Trying to figure out what model it is. So you can kind of maybe... This thing got torn up. Hey wow, welcome to What's That Thing, the game show where you learn facts you didn't ask for. Using the magic of the internet, I tracked down photos of this very car in the building before it collapsed and identified it. Go ahead and make your guesses now. If you guessed mid-70s Datsun B210, congrats, you win nothing. Thanks for playing, and now back to the exploration. While approaching the granite structure, I had the same questions you're probably wondering right now. What's inside, and what did this spot look like back in the day? Let me give you the rundown. I have a short attention span, so this will be quick. 1762, the first mill was constructed at this site. In 1775, the Potter family purchased the property and operated a grist mill, sawmill, and fulling mill. Wow, these guys were busy, huh? In 1843, everything was sold to the Babcock family, who constructed the main stone building and most of what we see here today. In 1885, the mill was sold to J.P. Campbell and Company. In 1902, it was sold to the Pawkatuck Woolen Mill Company, who, in 1903, rebuilt the dam to how we see it today. In 1930, it was sold again, this time to the Swift River Woolen Company, who produced fine wool cloth for men's clothing. In 1955, the mill was sold for the last time for production use to the Westerly Woolen Company with new owner, Mrs. Helen Cottrell. And in 1958, after only three years of operation, the mill was abruptly closed and abandoned, with the majority of the equipment left behind. Today, the granite building is easily the biggest draw here. It looks like a castle surrounded by a moat. Now, I mentioned earlier that it collapsed in on itself a few years ago. Five stories of wood, metal, and machinery crashing down. If you look closely, you can still see the carting machines among the wreckage that used to be on the top floor. Let me tell you, these things were huge. I'm talking 60 feet long and thousands of pounds. Check out this promotional photo of the same carting machine that was here. Now, imagine this thing falling through the floors below. Yikes. When in operation, these massive machines prepared wool for spinning by brushing the fibers to evenly align them. Now, after seeing the destruction here, you would think we couldn't just walk right into it. But this place was full of surprises.
This is inside Potter Hill Mill. I'm not going any further than this because it is completely sketchy in here. You can see through that doorway, the entire interior has collapsed inside of itself. And this staircase here just goes to nowhere. So we're gonna let it be for now. Some explorers were able to get in here within months of the total collapse. Now, would I climb the staircase to the top? Absolutely not. But here's the view if you did. This is at the top of the staircase looking at the partial collapse. To the left of this, you can see one of those carting machines I mentioned. You can also see how the floor is buckled here, so it wasn't long after that when everything fell. The last section we were able to check out was the brick weave shed, where the yarn produced here would be woven into cloth. Again, the floors in here were collapsed, exposing open water below. The destruction here is interesting to see because most of the time I see stuff like this from vandals. It's not often you get to see natural decay. Mother Nature just ripping this place down piece by piece. Conveniently, since the wall was partially collapsed, we were able to head right in and view rows of powered looms that were still set up. Some of these machines still had wool spools on them, and all of them were just frozen in time. There were even boxes of wooden bobbins that held the yarn still on the floor from over 60 years ago. That's just insane to see. This photo from the 1970s gives you a better idea of what this section used to look like. Still far from perfect, but nothing like today. As you can see, this place used to be bumpin' back in the day. But it's had a long fall from grace. So, why was it abandoned, and what's gonna happen to it? It closed for the same reason a lot of mills shut down at the time. Cheaper production elsewhere. It just didn't make sense financially to keep this going. So, it was shuttered with the hope that someone would buy it up and repurpose it. That didn't happen for a while though. The town obtained a demolition order from the Superior Court in 1980, but never followed through on the demolition. The property, which remained subject to the demolition order, was sold to Renewable Resources Inc. in 1992, who intended to restore the mill for residential and commercial use. There are detailed plans from 2007 of what they were going to convert this into. Very ambitious considering the condition, but obviously that didn't happen. Instead, the mill was basically ignored, which is usually the case with privately owned abandoned structures, especially when they start to look like this. Court orders through the past 30 years show disputes between the town, who wanted to immediately preserve or demolish the property, and the owner, who promised he was going to clean it up. The latest on file even says, review of the earlier lawsuits shows that the questions and arguments raised earlier seem to be repeated here. The town played nice for decades though because of the historic value. They figured threats of demolition would at least motivate the owner to make moves. This didn't work and in 2012 the town got serious and issued a notice of unsafe condition order to demolish, listing all the ways this place would kill you if you visited it. Want to know the most surprising part? It was given preliminary approval for nomination to the historic register, but was never added. The board found that the mill complex is not listed on the National Register of Historic Places, aka it is not protected. The rest of this court order is basically a back and forth of, um, you can't tear down my mills because I'm Ryan Gosling and you're not following guidelines, and, um, actually, yeah we can because you've done nothing here and it's dangerous. In conclusion, the court decided that yes, it can be demolished, but let's keep trying to save these buildings. Nothing happened though, and in 2019, the town council petitioned the property into receivership, asking a judge to approve transferring ownership of the mill and the dam to the town. In 2022, the town council members voted to demolish the crumbling mill but leave the dam alone. Besides the environmental hazard of everything being right on the water, residents were worried about the safety risk this poses for teens and explorers who visit the property. Hey, maybe my definition of safe is different, but this looks like an all-ages playground to me. Seriously though, it's really sad that this beautiful piece of history 
what's left to just rot here on the river. And while significant places like this have been saved, this likely won't be one of them. As of August 2022, the town plans to demolish the entire site by spring 2023. Which begs the question, at what point is an abandoned place beyond saving? I guess the silver lining here is that at least it gets to live out the rest of its life as a grail. So appreciate this now, because it won't be around much longer. To see more interesting Rhode Island icons like this and learn about their history, you can check out the rest of my videos on my YouTube channel right now. Thank you very much for watching.